Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I'm speaking to you today about uh, brownfield restoration, uh, a very exciting and dynamic area, and one where Western is really at the forefront of innovative uh, techniques and technologies. Uh, I'm from the uh, uh, Faculty of Engineering. I'm a Canada Research Chair in, in Environmental Restoration Technologies. And I'm happy to have the, to, just to step you through some of the exciting things that we're doing at Western today. What is a brownfield site? So just for those who aren't familiar, uh, brownfield sites are really derelict industrial or uh, commercial uh, facilities or sites uh, where there's uh, significant environmental contamination known to exist or, or suspected to exist. And uh, they're usually located in strategic uh, locations such as urban centers, waterfronts, downtown locations. Uh, and thereby they hold a really excellent potential for uh, being cleaned up and for being redeveloped as part of a sustainable urban strategy. Uh, the Toronto waterfront is a very important and current example. There is a $25 billion, 25 year plan in place to restore the entire length of the Toronto waterfront in, in numerous segments. And this encompasses uh, many, many uh, contaminated sites, uh, a wide range of different kinds of contaminants. Uh, and it's been, uh, in, it's obviously had an industrial past, it's sort of a legacy of, our, of, of industrialization. Uh, a lot of these sites are on prime land that are, are currently uh, underutilized. And, and cleanup is an important part of that process. Uh, Sydney Tar Ponds, another famous Canadian example, where uh, uh, over a hundred years of uh, operation of uh, steel production uh, and coke ovens led to tars and PCBs being released to the environment. And, and really the site has been uh, fenced off, the building's demolished and it sits unused. And they're currently uh, undergoing a 10 year, 10, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, $400 million plan to try and restore that site so it can be used effectively. How do these uh, contamination events occur? How do these sites get to be so uh, uh, hazardous and toxic? Well, typically it's either uh, poor handling and poor disposal activities of all the industrial chemicals that are used. Of course, industrial uh, chemicals have a lot of uh, very valuable uses in our uh, society and they've, they've really brought us forward, but we haven't have a good, necessarily have a good history of how we handle or dispose of them. Uh, also, we store our chemicals in underground tanks, underground lagoons. Uh, surface tanks and, and use pipelines and almost all of these or a high proportion of them actually leak. So we have a significant amount of leakage of the storage of these materials into the subsurface. What are some of the important pollutants that we're studying uh, at Western? You can see a, a, a long list of hazardous organic, organic compounds which of course uh, have uh, serious health implications for us uh, organic creatures. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, inorganics, the metals, arsenic, mercury, and lead, that I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, as well as some emerging pollutants of concern, uh, such as the endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, nanoparticles are uh, emerging as a very uh, vibrant and highly used uh, new particle. And we have no idea what its health effects might be or, or how far it could travel in the environment, uh, as well as pharmaceuticals. Among the organic liquids, we have things that you might be familiar with, the PCBs, which have been now discontinued, but of course, a hundred years of their use means that they're distributed in the environment to a significant extent. Uh, the coal tar, pesticides, gasoline and diesel. Uh, you'll see I have some samples down here below the podium, and the black goo that you see there is coal tar, and that's a, uh, very frequently encountered in almost any industrialized city uh, around the world. Why are these uh, can, can contaminants of concern? Well, as they get into the environment, of course, they make their way back into the food chain, they make their way back into our water supplies, and they ultimately affect us and the environment around us. Uh, cancer, uh, birth defects, sterility, immune suppression, all of these things are, are documented for a large number of these compounds, not to mention the synergistic effect of these compounds together uh, in the environment. Uh, the, the photo up here, or the, the site map, is of a, of a cluster of leukemia cases, a very famous uh, case in, in uh, Massachusetts, where they had very high rates of leukemia that was linked back to extensive groundwater contamination uh, by chlorinated solvents. 
How common is this problem? Well, we have uh, uh, over 30,000 brownfield sites currently known in uh, Canada. And here is just a, a map of one fraction of those. One, only one of those contaminants that I listed. This is the chlorinated solvents. And you can see that uh, anywhere there was significant industrial activity, uh, we have chlorinated solvent uh, problems. Uh, and add on to that all of the other contaminants that I listed earlier. You can imagine it's a very significant issue. Very, very expensive to try and clean up these sites. You can multiply that by uh, tens, uh, to up to uh, hundreds of thousands of sites uh, throughout uh, North America. And these are just, this is a map showing you just what we call mega sites, which are uh, sites about uh, unusual extents or cost to remediate, or uh, a high extents of contamination. And you can see they're located all over, uh, wherever there was uh, uh, nuclear testing, wherever there was major power plants, ma major chemical manufacturing facilities, or major uh, chemical disposal facilities. Why, do we, why is remediation so important towards sustainable development? Well, of course, uh, it's been shown that for every dollar we spend on restoring the environment, we get multiple uh, dollars back towards the economy in terms of uh, uh, net benefit to Canada. Of course, there's health benefits, there's revenue, economy, jobs, uh, revitalization of, of downtown urban communities, uh, um, and uh, avoiding any c construction on a green field is possible whenever you restore a brown field. So why am I up here talking about this as an engineer? Well, the fact is that cleaning up these sites, we've been making the mess for about, let's say, 80 to 100 years now. And over the last 20 years, we've been focusing on cleaning them up. But for most of those major contaminants I've been mentioning, we actually haven't cleaned up perfectly down to back to what the natural environment would have been one single site. And what it, why that is is because these contaminants are highly recalcitrant. They're highly resistant to natural dispersion and natural processes that would clean up those sites. So really many, many of those worst sites require us to step in and impose a technological uh, approach. Uh, and that's why in engineering we're working very hard to try and figure out innovative ways to clean up these sites without bringing those uh, contaminants to the surface and exposing people to those hazards uh, to a further degree. So we're trying to figure out ways to clean up those sites in the ground, what we call in situ, without bringing the contaminants to the surface. Uh, and here is a, a site map uh, of a site that was contaminated back in the early 1900s uh, with coal tar. And you see that they were, they were actually trying to redevelop that site. And when they did so, they, they drilled some cores and the cores came out dripping with this black goo I have in the uh, jar down here. And so you see 100 years later, uh, it's exactly the way it was when it was released. Uh, nothing's improved. So I want to represent to you the, uh, a new group uh, at uh, the Faculty of Engineering at Western called RESTORE. RESTORE stands for uh, Research for Subsurface Transport and Remediation. And it's an exciting new group of young professors. There's four of us at the moment who are the co-directors of RESTORE. And we have uh, a wide, range, uh, wide array of research uh, and a large cohort of excellent graduate students and postdocs working on many facets of the problems associated with brownfield uh, restoration. Uh, we have uh, over 25 people in the group and uh, a large amount of external funding. It's a very uh, important and, uh, and uh, well-funded area. We have uh, four laboratories and some uh, commercial testing facilities now. Uh, we also work very heavily with computer modeling uh, and we work extensively with industry and with our uh, academic colleagues around the world. Uh, that's very important to address some of these uh, multidisciplinary problems through physics, chemistry, and also uh, uh, um, beyond engineering and the social uh, and other uh, environmental science aspects of the problem. We really focus in our group on better understanding brownfields and how contaminants behave. And then we do a lot of work on developing new and innovative technologies that can uh, help remediate some of the toughest, most difficult to clean up sites. Uh, one of our group looks at uh, introducing innovatively designed nanoparticles into the subsurface, having them migrate to the areas of concern and chemically react with the contaminants in the subsurface to destroy them in situ. Uh, and that's being led by my colleague uh, Dennis O'Carroll. 
We have another uh, group that is looking at uh, the nanoparticles currently being used. Oh, I should go back for a second and say that uh, this, uh, the research that's been done in the lab so far has been so successful that a company ha is working with us to do a field trial uh, later this summer. So that's a really exciting development. Now, uh, there are a lot of companies already using nanoparticles, and you'll see many uh, posters around here talking about the beneficial effects uh, and properties of nanoparticles. These nanoparticles are now being disposed of to the environment, and we really have no idea what their transport, how far they can move, can they move into the groundwater, are they a threat to human health. So we have another thread of research in our group that's looking at uh, how far can they migrate and under what conditions in the subsurface we expect them to be a problem. And I say that field trials are happening because these are going into the environment already and we know very little about them. We really have a, a, a wide and diverse group looking at the complicated chemistry and the complicated physics that govern the migration of these contaminants uh, and really dictates uh, where we'll find them uh, and how we can best mobilize them uh, to get them out. We have a new recruit, Dr. Claire Robinson, uh, an outstanding young researcher who just came to us after spending a year in Bangladesh, uh, really looking in detail and working with the people on the ground on the arsenic problems that they have in their groundwater. Um, they have serious uh, natural arsenic contamination and there are uh, engineering uh, and appropriate technologies that can be applied uh, to help them uh, get the arsenic either out of their water or access other water that uh, is not uh, contaminated with arsenic. And so uh, she continues to work on that and is going to be taking on graduate students and developing a whole program around appropriate technologies in arsenic contaminated groundwater. We also have a, a large group uh, uh, doing a, uh, quite a bit of uh, advanced computer modeling. This is just one slide showing uh, really, you know, uh, even though over the last 80 years we've spilled a lot of these contaminants into the field, the truth is right now we, it's hard to know where they are and we, we're not allowed anymore to intentionally spill these things for a good reason. So we, to do field studies is very difficult. So one of the ways we look at field scale cleanup uh, and behavior contaminants is by using advanced computer models uh, and, and uh, using those design tools uh, for, for designing innovative remediation strategies. One uh, new technology that we've recently patented and are now uh, moving from the lab into the field for several different field trials in US and in Canada is called STAR. And STAR is a technique where we use uh, a process of smoldering combustion, which is uh, a very slow burning, sort of, uh, it's the, when you see charcoal briquettes very, very slowly smoldering away, that's the process of uh, smoldering. We're applying that to sub, uh, a select group of subsurface contaminants, uh, uh, hydrocarbons in particular, uh, so say from the oil patch, and also coal tars and creosotes, uh, like the ones I showed you down here. And what we do in this case is we uh, locate where the uh, contaminants are on the subsurface and we start a very local, very small smoldering reaction. Uh, and once that reaction starts, as you can imagine, it starts to proceed and it can sustain itself. That's why it's called self-sustaining. We don't actually have to add any more energy. It'll just sustain itself and travel through the pathway of contamination, destroy the contamination as it goes. And what we've shown, you can see some of the samples of the soils we've treated here. I brought them along. Uh, you can see that it has this um, uh, remarkable ability to be self-sustaining also self-tracking, and once all the contamination is uh, eaten up, it turns itself off, and it, it's also self-terminating. So it has some very unique properties. It's very exciting technology. Um, we've done a lot of work. Here's an example of uh, one of the largest um, uh, outside, I call it an outside field experiment that we did, uh, where we brought in a, a large uh, container of uh, cont coal tar contaminated soil, and after 24 hours, which is very, very quick in the remediation industry. Uh, we had uh, non-detect contamination and virtually clean soil. So very, very exciting opportunities uh, for this technology. And we're moving ahead with some field trials this summer, uh, both in Canada and the US. So I'll have more news to report on those. So I encourage you, if you're interested in this area, you'd like to, to work with us or talk to us about what we do, um, I'll be here and we have a poster uh, over by the far corner there. 
Um, I encourage you to get in touch with us, and uh, we're always looking for uh, new collaborators, new opportunities, and, uh, and, and making as much headway as we can uh, with our team of students. So thank you very much.